Perfect. Okay, we are recording and it's uh, at time to start. So I'll turn it over to you, Anita. Uh, thanks so much, um, Erica. Um, if folks want to introduce themselves in the chat, that would be awesome um, so that you can um, get to know each other. Also, if you want to just drop in a little message around what um, made you interested in this session, that would be great. Um, I wanted this to be more of a conversation. Um, and for those folks that are going to be watching this later, uh, we'll make sure that anything that is on the chat or also um, that we're dropping in the chat or that we're talking about in the chat, that we'll also kind of say out loud. Um, quick little introduction. My name is Juanita Lee Garcia and I'm calling in from Toronto. Um, it is very customary for our organization to do a land acknowledgement. And what I like to talk about in mine is that in my reflection as a first generation settler in Toronto, I've been very compelled to learn about uh, the traditional uh, land and uh, territories of, uh, I think you can see the chat on the side, the traditional land and territory of the Haudenosaunee, Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation, the Anishinaabe and the Chibigua. I've learned that this territory is now the home to many uh, diverse Indigenous uh, and First Nation folks, including the Inuit and Métis peoples, and that it's covered by the Toronto Purchase Treaty 13 of 1805 and the Williams Treaty signed with multiple Mississaugas and Chippewa bands. And as part of our work, we continue to learn and unlearn and acknowledge traditional Indigenous knowledge as we um, build curriculum in our organization. Um, the Truth and Reconciliation Commission uh, in Canada was formed in 2012, and um, in 2021, um, we continue to do the work that is essential for us as settlers, as we name our privileges that we hold, which make um, this space that we're able to come uh, together in possible. Um, well, it's very customary for us to acknowledge the land on which we work, live, and study, Land acknowledgements can also be very problematic if don't, they don't create the space for reflection and mobilization. Um, when set as symbolic gestures or just opening statements, these acknowledgements often fetishize actual tangible and concrete treaties. And it's really important for us to acknowledge that treaties are not metaphors, but they're real institutions that are for all of us to uphold. If any of you are interested in talking about our land acknowledgement or um, any indigenous uh, resources that you might need to learn more about the lands that you occupy, please let us know. Um, I will share my information with folks after the presentation. A little bit my, about myself. Um, my name is Juanita, as I mentioned. I've been at Venture for Canada for three years, and I'm the Senior Manager of Strategic Partnerships and Social Impact at Venture for Canada. I joined the organization to lead social innovation projects, weaving social innovation theories and frameworks from Francis Wesley into everything that we did to establish um, stronger sources of self-generating revenue for the long-term financial sustainability of the organization. I'll talk a little bit about Venture for Canada in a second, um, but uh, for my background, I'm coming from a education and uh, sales background. I have a master's in adult education from the University of Toronto in higher education and community development uh, from OISE. I also have a master's of fine arts from the University of Western Ontario, where I did a lot of work in conceptual and visual artwork. And um, I come from a background working in tech sales and retail and kind of my most recent career trajectory has been social innovation, social impact and um, marketing. Um, today, we're gonna be talking about a couple of other things but I wanted to, about Venture for Canada, about what we do and kind of like our questions around entrepreneurial skills and entrepreneurial skills development as the predominant skills of the future of work. But I wanted to start with why we were interested in hosting this space as a registered national charity and um, why we're here today at, um, at ARIS uh, in the first kind of collaboration summit with Impact Canada. When we saw the theme of future projections that are changing the future of work, we got really excited about the framing. Um, we've been in a lot of conversations about, you know, the shifting nature of work, about a digital and global economy um, and gig economy work and entrepreneurship that started around 2013. And a lot of this conversation has now shifted from what skills the young people need to have to enter the workforce 
to how do we build a systems change approach where employers, institutions collaborate with young people entering the workforce and get their input into reimagining what the workforce will look like in the next 10 years. So this kind of approach is something that we're really interested in. And while Venture for Canada is a programs delivery organization, this year, in addition to carrying our programs virtually, we've also made the efforts to focus on knowledge mobilization and um, sharing the insights that we've gained directly from our participants and our programs and our research over the past seven years to encourage forward thinking debate and to understand what we as a society and part of like a collective of um, support systems to the higher education community need to do now to continue to help others gain career resiliency and clarity for our future. Um, does anybody have any questions or uh, have folks heard about Venture for Canada previously? You can use your, um, like raise your hand or if somebody, has anybody heard of Venture for Canada previously? Trent, I see potentially. Uh, if folks have heard for, for Venture for America, we're two different organizations. So just, uh, just so that you keep that in, in mind. Um, this is our first time presenting to a US audience. So thank you for having us. A little bit about Venture for Canada. Uh, Venture for Canada is a national registered charity here in Canada that fosters the entrepreneurial skill sets and mindsets in young Canadians. Uh, to us, uh, being entrepreneurial means to create opportunity, to act upon opportunities to create value for others. And through our programs, we recruit, train, and support young people to work for innovative Canadian small businesses and startups. Um, the focus of our programs is to develop for individuals to develop the network knowledge and entrepreneurial skills um, required to thrive in the future of work so that they can have more impactful careers. Our mission as a national charity is to, again, foster the entrepreneurial mindsets and skill sets of young Canadians. And our vision is a Canada where young people can equitably realize uh, their entrepreneurial potential to build the mo most prosperous place in the world. So there's a couple of really big themes and words that we use in our mission and vision statement and in our boilerplate. And part of that is something that I would love for all of you to keep in mind as we kind of break up what we mean and really kind of dissect some of these grand uh, ideas of a prosperous society and um, and what it means to equitably realize that. Some questions that I would love for folks uh, who are here to consider while we kind of go through this presentation, I'll basically be talking for about 30 minutes. Um, if you have any thoughts, um, feel free to take yourself off mute um, at any time, kind of popcorn style, ask any questions. And if you um, want to send me a chat, feel free to use the chat function as well. But one of the things that would be really helpful as we kind of have this future focused debate and put our ideas out there is to think about what research questions surfaced for you throughout the presentation. Um, I'd loved any kind of suggestions or thoughts around how nonprofits um, can collaborate with academia to build data-driven programs. Um, I'm gonna talk about EntreComp and I would love to know if anybody's familiar with that term, if there's a race of hands around EntreComp. Okay, I don't see any. Um, okay, great. So we're gonna be talking about EntreComp and I'd love to, for folks to think about um, how we would adopt EntreComp in Canada and the US and like if there's cultural barriers into doing so and what research would we need to complete to engage and implement the EntreComp model in our universities, our post-secondaries in our nonprofits and in our kind of training sector and what other data um, is, is missing in order for us to be able to take a systems approach to the future of work and uh, incorporate that into uh, higher education and skills-based training programs. So the title of this uh, se session originally was, um, uh, you know, um, uh, entrepreneurial skills and, uh, and innovation for like the future of our cities. And we decided to kind of take cities out and talk about community. So um, instead of it being entrepreneurial skills, 
the predominant skills of the future of work and the future of our cities. I'd like for you to think about this as the predominant skills of the future of work and the future of our communities. Just to ensure that when we talk about cities, we're not talking about, you know, urban hubs like Toronto, Seattle, San Diego, but we're uh, talking about uh, innovation communities, which can form at the outskirts of urban hubs and even in remote rural areas, as well as in virtual spaces. So I just wanted to redefine that for a second. Um, I'm going to be talking about some of the barriers that we've come across and some of the observations that we've kind of gained over the past seven years of working uh, as an entrepreneurial skills development organization. And um, one of the things that Dr. Emily DiRocco mentioned, the CEO of E3 mentioned this morning was she talked about how rapidly um, changing technologies are outpacing the skills gap and that being one of the primary challenges. And then how the, um, the pace of which technology is advancing is also not letting our systems and assessments um, to keep up with the ways in which the future of work needs us to do. So we really, I really kind of took that away as, as, a, as something that she mentioned this morning, because it's something that we've kind of have continued to see over the past seven years. Um, the further ahead we think we are, uh, you know, there's a big technological advancement and then we kind of fall behind and we're seeing folks struggle with the same problems to get into the labor force year over year, irregardless of their uh, degree, irregardless of their, uh, you know, the institution that they're graduating from and recent grads continue to struggle with kind of like the same challenges. So some of the observations that we've made um, that we think uh, need a systems change approach um, include the lack of a common language. One of the things that we've kind of been able to, to observe in our programs, but really haven't been able to measure is that we believe that the skills gap isn't actually that great. The, the bigger gap is the gap around skills language. People don't actually know what skills, how to describe their skills and what language to use when they're talking about a functional role um, in the labor force. And so we think that that is one of like the biggest gaps is actually the gap around language, uh, skills-based language, and just an understanding of uh, a common language across the ecosystem uh, of innovation and entrepreneurship in general. Um, one of the other ones is entrecom and 21st century skills and how in US and Canada, we've been slower to a, a kind of adopt a competencies-based model to do, um, skills-based learning and training and how to incorporate that into post-secondary education, so college and universities, um, as well as identifying, you know, what, what do we mean when we say prosperous and thriving communities? Um, I'm also going to be talking about some of the data gaps uh, that we've come across and that are really impossible to find that limit our ability to make informed programming decisions. And um, I have a couple of calls to action based on the questions that I've asked you to reflect on as I go through kind of my presentation. Does anybody have any questions? Good so far? Okay. Um, I'll continue to kind of check the chat for questions as well. So what do I mean when um, I talk about uh, entrepreneurial or being entrepreneurial, having entrepreneurial skills and entrepreneurial mindsets. The Oxford Dictionary um, defines this as being entrepreneurial as being characterized by the taking of financial risk in the hope of profit, enterprising and entrepreneurial culture. And the biggest kind of problem that we've come across when we say we want the future of work to be entrepreneurial is that people think of this very, very limited and narrow definition. Um, that is centered around capitalism and centered around profit. And we see this, um, you know, people coming from uh, business schools, we see this uh, specifically in like the context of French language is that people equate entrepreneurship or entrepreneurialism with business. And so we were trying to find a common language to support kind of like our thinking around entrepreneurial skills development and economic development. And we came across um, an expanded definition in Entrecomp. So Entrecomp, which I'll talk a little bit more about, 
and defines entrepreneurship as a transversal competence, which applies to all the spheres of life, from nurturing personal development to actively participating in society to re-entering the job market as an employee or as a self-employed person and also starting up ventures. So it's not necessarily around um, the idea of profit, but it's around or risk-taking uh, in terms of um, fin financial risk-taking, but it's also like a social risk and actively participating in society. And it builds on a broad definition of entrepreneurship that hinges on the creation of cultural, social, or economic value. And it embraces a different type of entrepreneurship, which includes um, uh, entrepreneurship, social entrepreneurship, green entrepreneurship, and digital entrepreneurship. And it applies to teams or organizations and refers to value creation in the private, public, and um, any kind of hybrid sector or combination of private, public, and hybrid sectors. And it also... Um, is a neutral domain. So um, kind of defines on acting upon opportunities and ideas to generate values for others in any domain possible in um, kind of like our social value chain. So we found this um, definition uh, a couple of years ago uh, in 2017. And we came across the Entrecom framework, which has been developed through mixed media methods and approaches. And it's made up of a compre comprehensive review of academic and great literature and in-depth analysis of case studies, desk research, and a set of um, other multi-stakeholder uh, consultations in the European Union. And so how we've come to kind of redefine it at Venture for Canada is, you know, to be entrepreneurial is to act upon opportunities to create values for others. And that really broad, socially grounded definition um, has allowed us to look as entre at, at entrepreneurship and entrepreneurialism as a uh, competency that can be developed through skills and uh, other kind of competent, uh, it's a larger competency that can be developed through um, smaller competency frameworks and skills-based uh, training um, to, to encourage folks to think beyond, uh, you know, going into the labor force as employees or as employers, but to think about impact, to think about sustainability, to have long-term um, ethical and sustainable um, visions of our future workforce. Um, one of the things that is a limitation of Entrecomp is um, the assessment, you know, assessing somebody for their competency development um, isn't, you know, isn't something that has been done. Um, it's to develop an assessment based on the theory. Um, we just haven't done that fast enough. And the European Union is working kind of right now as of August, 2020 on developing an assessment framework. But again, our assessment frameworks um, based on technology aren't kind of keeping up. So this is kind of like one of the biggest limitations that, that we found is how do we assess for, for entrepreneurial skills growth over time as participants go through our programs. So folks mentioned that nobody here is familiar with, with Entrecomp. And so um, to give you a little bit of background on Entrecomp, at, its, at a simplest level, Entrecomp is made up of three competence areas. Um, ideas and opportunities, resources, and into action competencies. And each of these areas contains five core competencies. Um, you can see that the interaction are matched with the green here, the resources are matched with the orange here, and uh, the ideas and opportunities are, marked, are, are matched with this purple here. And so together, these make up like 15 primary competencies of um, entrepreneurial skills. There is no hierarchy to any of these and they're all of equal importance. So each bucket is of equal importance and each competency is of equal importance when we're talking about entrepreneurial uh, ism and an entrepreneurial competent person. Um, based on what we've heard from partner startups, employers and participants at Venture for Canada, we've prioritized some of the competency development areas emphasizing them at different stages of our training program. 
and our various training programs. Um, again, while Entrecomp has been highly endorsed, the framework hasn't been adopted at a, at a systematic level and it's not really tested in regular settings. So this is something that we've continued to kind of think about is how do we assess people? And most of it is self-assessment. So self-assessing individuals that come through our programs on their perceived uh, their perceived understanding of the competency and their perceived uh, um, their their own perceived idea of, of, of how they hold this competency and how advanced they are in that competency and then evaluate them at the end to see if there's comparable growth. Um, but it's again, something that we haven't fully uh, struggled with and that the uh, European Union has not developed fully. As I mentioned in August of 2020, um, there was a project called the Entrecomp Implementation, which is an Erasmus project that aims to um, operationalize the Entrecomp framework by developing uh, implementation tools and training content for European vocational training, education, and um, environments that promote entrepreneurship. Um, but again, it's not fast enough. They have identified kind of like the six main areas that they want to work on. Um, but one of the things that we've done is look at Entrecomp in combination with 21st century skills and um, the way in which we've kind of categorized uh, 21st century skills in North America has been through like the three buckets of human skills, hybrid skills, and technical skills. And the ones that align the most with Entrecomp end up being the kind of what we call human skills. And you can see that there's a direct link between the competence needed to be entrepreneurial and the human skills required to thrive in our current, um, you know, digital knowledge and performance economy. Um, this is something that we're really interested in thinking about is when we develop competency-based frameworks and competency-based uh, jobs, can we uh, build in skills development around leadership and innovation when we're talking about, um, you know, uh, mobilizing others and motivation and perseverance? And how do we support students and young people to be able to talk about these uh, competencies and skill sets when they're entering the labor force. Um, these are some of kind of our observations. And so, as I mentioned, um, our mission or our vision is a more uh, prosperous and equitable Canada. And while that's a very grand idea, we're talking about, you know, uh, when we're talking about prosperous and thriving communities, we're talking about uh, a concept that we're taking from Ian Hathaway. Uh, if anybody has read the Startup Community Way, um, it's something that we have really centered our work around. And we're talking about um, communities that are complex adaptive systems. So again, taking from, from social innovation and systems thinking, um, we think that prosperous and thriving communities are um, the communities that kind of hold these, these kind of areas as just some of their foundational pillars. And I think um, we talked about the folks this morning kind of talked a little bit about this in terms of like um, the future of work requires our communities and our cities and our labor force to have these systems set up so that we are setting up people for success when they go into these systems. Um, to explain a, uh, a complex adaptive uh, system, um, you can look at what a, a simple system is. So a simple system is a system that has one single path into a single answer. And if you want to get to the solution, there's one way, just one way to do it. A complicated system is a system that has multiple paths to a single answer. To get to the answer, you have to have multiple different choices you can make. However, there's only one correct solution. And when we talk about the future of work and the future of our communities, we see them as complex systems that is well, that has multiple paths with multiple answers. And when you include the word adaptive, you end up uh, with the system that changes based on the choices you make. And as a result of those choices, the answers change. So 
the nature of our the future of work and the nature of our communities is uh, ones that are unpredictable. There's no like recipe to create a specific outcome. Uh, they require constant evaluation. They require constant agility, and they require an impact framework and measurements that continue to challenge our assumptions. And that's what we have identified as the hardest kind of part around uh, the future of work and the future of our cities is that um, they're constantly, we're constantly going to have these conversations and we have to kind of center that agility and changes as part of the conversations. Um, does anybody have any questions? Okay, great. Um, a little bit about um, what we have identified here at Venture for Canada with our mission of kind of um, de developing and enhancing the entrepreneurial skills and mindsets of young Canadians is that this actually needs to start in their first year of post-secondary education and needs to be part of that uh, education that they have. Um, while they're going through their kind of domain knowledge. And this is this applies to interdisciplinary um, kind of career choices. So we um, don't think that it's only for STEM students or for business students or for arts and humanities students or for college or university students. We actually um, work with students across disciplines and across um, different stages of their post-secondary journey. But what we've kind of done is develop three programs that take you on a pathway and we believe that year one and year two is a great kind of place for folks to be introduced to micro work integrated learning opportunities plus entrepreneurial skills development and plus um, entrepreneurial competencies language and skills based language year three and four um, are great for immersive work integrated learning so internships co-ops and but they need to include entrepreneurial skills training and they need to include uh, skills based language training as well. And then once folks graduate is where they need the most support. And this is like ongoing uh, intensive professional development support plus entrepreneurial skills training and skills uh, based competencies training. And so what we've done is we've actually, uh, we started actually with graduates and kind of identified that by the time people come to our program, they are, really, really smart. They know what they want to do. They've been through four years of uh, college. They've been through um, pitch competitions and they've uh, created some like really interesting uh, lived experience while they're at university, but they still have such a hard time entering the labor force and entering specifically the innovation and technology and um, in-demand labor force. And so in order to kind of get them up to speed, we actually need to reach them at an earlier stage in their post-secondary journey. And what we've been kind of um, able to do is develop different programs. So um, our fellowship program, which is for the ones for, for recent grads, we've, um, we've really identified that the people that will thrive in this program are people with those core leadership skills. And so how do we develop those core leadership skills and entrepreneurial skills at earlier stages? And we built an internship program and recently an externship program so that we're able to expose students uh, to work integrated learning opportunities and um, entrepreneurial skills based training as early as possible through um, short term duration programs to midterm duration programs to a longer term commitment program. Um, we have also decided to scale in ways to explore entrepreneurial skills development um, by supporting post-secondaries and uh, selling our services uh, or having a fee-for-service model to support career centers, support faculties and support professors as well as other nonprofits and accelerators with developing their entrepreneurial skills based uh, training and frameworks and then we've also are starting to pilot a reskilling program to think about how entrepreneurial skills need to be an essential part of the reskilling um, trajectory even though we know that reskilling programs often uh, have traditionally you know failed in in terms of um, skilling folks to go into in-demand jobs 
we think that entrepreneurial skills will make that biggest entrepreneurial skills and skills based language will make that biggest shift in um, helping reskilling programs be successful. Um, specifically, when we're talking about in demand jobs. And then we also identified that the other part of the system that's that's missing is um, the employers. As much as we say the future of work is entrepreneurial and the future of work and the future of our cities uh, needs to be innovative, employers need to be opening open to hiring folks for their skill set first, and then their experience and domain knowledge. And this is kind of the biggest shift in the system that we think will really support. Our, our work um, is that if we train employers on what to look for and how to identify entrepreneurial skills, they'll be able to get ramped up faster and lead to more successful um, ventures. In terms of how we've kind of leveraged the EntreComp to build our training and 21st century skills to build our training, um, at Venture for Canada is we've really done a lot of community-based participatory research and asked startups and small and medium businesses around kind of like what skills they think they need versus what skills they're putting in job postings and um, really ensuring that we're doing uh, in just in time training as opposed to just in case learning. So every year our curriculum changes every year, the ways in which our, um, our training uh, delivery changes um, the way that we adapt to virtual kind of space changes and what we emphasize changes year over year so that we can kind of really stay up to up to date on what young Canadians need and on what um, startup and um, small and medium enterprises need for people to succeed in the labor force. Um, but then again, we've we've had, you know, we try to make a lot of our program decisions based on data that we collect. And we've had, uh, we've seen a lot of data shortages. So there's a ton of data gaps in Canada and the US around, um, around entrepreneurial skills and competencies, um, around, um, uh, there's, yeah, uh, there's a question. So I have a quick question. Would it be possible for you to give specific from the field's examples regarding learning common skills language? Yeah, that is, that's a great question. So one of the things that kind of we've talked about common skills languages is talking about when you're in a, um, for, young, for young people, when they go into a job interview um, and they read a job description, it says, you know, to do this job, you need good, to do a sales job, you need good negotiation skills. Very rarely in curriculum, and in like uh, the outcomes of a project or any type of training, do we say at the end of this, you will learn negotiation skills and actually break down what negotiation skills mean. And so people go in saying like, I have great negotiation skills, but they don't end up negotiating their salary or don't actually end up performing those skills. So there's a difference between understand, you know, not understanding what the skill set is or knowing the language for what the skill set is um, understanding the components of the skill set and then uh, actually performing that skill set. And so instead of saying, um, you know, at the end, as a, at the end of, of this project, you'll learn negotiation skills is at the end of this project, you'll learn to um, answer objections to questions. You'll learn to um, communicate your needs and ensure that the client is meeting their needs. You'll learn to uh, propose a value proposition and actually kind of package all the components of that skill. Um, that's just kind of like one example that comes to mind right away that we see often, uh, you know, people not actually performing this skill set that a job requires or not knowing kind of like even like what research skills are. So you'll say like research skills are needed for this job. And then very rarely, even graduate students will be able to break down like, okay, this is what research actually means. Does that make sense? Cool. Um, some, of the, some of the data gaps uh, is that we found in terms of entrepreneurial abilities and going into the kind of entrepreneurial sector um, or wanting to kind of develop 
entrepreneurial skills and competencies is that there's a lot of risk that comes with um, participating in like, you know, training programs or participating in leadership programs where you don't know if you're going to get a job afterwards. And um, there's a lot of risk going into entrepreneurial career paths. So paths at startups or at small, medium-sized businesses, just because of the um, ambiguity and not being able to kind of cope with ambiguity. And so one of the things that we've kind of wanted to look at over the years is, um, you know, does having a lot of student debt deter our communities from seeking out entrepreneurial career paths? Um, another one is uh, the actual, like when we do research around like the skills gap shortage is, is it, you know, is this only perceived? A lot of the, the research says like, you know, educators feel youth are prepared, employers feel youth are not prepared and youth agree that they're semi-prepared. And so where are these kind of perceptions and feelings coming from? And kind of, is it just, are we skill sets? I think I, I froze. I saw my screen kind of froze. Um, but we've really kind of come across a lot of gaps in trying to understand like debt and entrepreneurial skills and um, kind of perceived ideas of readiness and entrepreneurial skills, as well as um, equity and representation in the um, innovation and tech sectors, as well as in the entrepreneurial uh, kind of ecosystem. So these are just kind of some of the larger kind of gaps that we're seeing that are related to who's in the entrepreneurship space, um, who's kind of participating in entrepreneurial skills readiness, um, why people are hesitant to participate or adopt entrepreneurial skills mindsets and kind of how they perceive it. Um, I think I froze, but if I missed something, let, let me know. Um, a little bit about our impact. One of the things that, you know, we have a hard time measuring is impact when it comes to entrepreneurial skills development. Like what are we trying to, if we can't assess the, the competency development, what are we assessing? And what we've kind of decided to, to focus our impact on is the diversity and representation of the participants of our program, the institutions that they're coming from, uh, the programs that they're coming from, the startups that partner with us to employ some of these young people, and they assess the self-assessment of the participants on our on the difference they believe the program made in their lives. And these all tend to be, uh, you know, more, uh, I would say, kind of satisfaction metrics but it's very tough to measure the actual like or assess an actual like enhancement of entrepreneurial skills beyond a self-perceived um, enhancement and awareness. So I'm going to loop back to kind of the questions that oh, I asked um, at the beginning, which were what kind of research surfaced for you throughout the presentation what are some thoughts around um, how nonprofits can collaborate with academia to build data-driven programs? Should we adopt the entrecomp model in Canada and the US? Um, and if so, what are, what are the cultural barriers to doing so? What research do we need to, com to complete to um, engage and impl implement the entrecomp model? And how do we have a bigger influence on a systems change approach? How do we recruit, how do you recruit your cohort? Um, so for, we have three different programs and they're all cohort based, um, the internship, externship and fellowship. And we recruit our cohorts um, by connecting with post-secondaries. So we connect with post-secondaries across Canada and um, we have info sessions, we have um, events, we, um, talk about entrepreneurial skills and entrepreneurship quite a bit in our recruitment events. And it's a three-stage recruitment process. Um, so we do a, um, we don't look at resumes, so we don't ask for, for resumes. We do a um, 
the first kind of stage of the application process is just informational, um, why you're interested in entrepreneurship and uh, what you want to get out of the program. The second stage of the process is a phone interview and a um, values alignment. So we look at our uh, competencies and, and we've turned them into values and we look at values alignment. And then the final stage, we actually do a selection event where we have um, alumni of the program, um, as well as leaders from the entrepreneurial ecosystem in Canada um, assess the participants or the, the applicants on a series of um, interview and challenged based questions. So we're looking at um, their entrepreneur entrepreneurial potential based on the competencies. And it's uh, all selected by um, members from our community. Hello, I do have a question actually. Um, can I ask? Of course. Um, so, you know, I, you know, I teach, I'm a professor. So I think about, you know, these questions from the perspective of a professor, uh, and also like implementing in higher education and I teach in humanities and arts. So, uh, these questions like come up a lot. And one of the things like that really like, you know, um, you know, that has occupied me, I guess, is this question of like, you know, uh, how can we like, you know, like this question of data gaps, right? I think it's really important. And one of the data gaps I guess we have right now is the connection between like the training for such skills within higher education. I think, you know, it, you know, everything you talked to you like, you know, like it makes sense, but also what else goes in higher education? Because we kind of like now divide these, right? There's like a skills training focus, you know, in higher education and also like what else, you know, happens, right? And, and I'm just like, and we do assume that they're like separate, you know, um, and, and I'm, you know, just like one, like, to me, it seems like there's a data gap, like, I don't see any actual, like, you know, statistics on this, like, kind of like evaluating futures training versus like, what else goes in higher education. And that actually makes me think about like, especially thinking about like, you know, now, now I want to like, think with your point about the systems approach, right? So now I'm thinking like, are we actually isolating the future of our skills? Uh, you know, really, you know, in a way that's not actually like helping understand what else goes in the higher education that can help the training. And I know that kind of like this question is big, but it, I think, you know, like your points about the systems, you know, perspective, I think is like, you know, applying that to higher education uh, or applying to like, you know, skills training within the context of higher education seems interesting. And also like your point about the data gaps that we have. Uh, we have a lot of like conversations on skills, skills training, but as you point out, like we do actually like a lot of data and we rely on like certain like consulting companies, which has its own like, you know, perhaps like biases in terms of like how they frame these, you know, uh, questions. So anyway, so these, it's not really a question, I guess. It's more like just like wondering, like if you can help me, like, you know, think about this a little bit. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think that this was why we were interested in in hosting this space. Is it's not really for questions, but more of like uh, debate and conversation. So I appreciate you. Um, I appreciate you, kind of, yeah, coming to that to the table with that perspective. Um, a couple of things. I think the first thing is um, the role of you know you're talking about domain knowledge. So what exists in higher education is you have your domain knowledge, which is like the uh, your curriculum and your learning outcomes. So you have your domain knowledge and then you have your learning outcomes. And at the end of your course, and especially in like any arts or humanities, the learning outcomes are typically tied to the domain knowledge. So at the end of this course, you'll be able to A, B, and C. And then with some skill sets. So you'll be able to like analyze, you'll be able to distill data, you'll be able to um, uh, debate, whatever it is that are the softer skills that come with the curriculum. What's missing is yes, that the future of work skills and labor force skills have been separated from that. So we kind of isolate them into careers or we isolate them into being living in like other different spheres of the university. So, oh, in your co-op, you talk about your labor force skills. We don't talk about that in our, you know, our history curriculum. 
can you can you know academia tie in um, labor force skills into curriculum and, and like domain knowledge and say when you're learning art history and you're learning um, art history and doing like an analysis on a um, a gallery or a, a museum, are you also exercising um, different skills like long-term ethical and sustainable thinking or mobilizing others to take action into ensuring the arts uh, are part of our society for a long time? Can we do that? I think so. Yeah, I think that we just have to have like a framework that is adopted into curriculum and domain knowledge that ties in um, the labor force skill sets. And then how do you apply that? So I think the application or the performance of that skill set is something that we also don't talk about in academia. And could there be supporting organizations like Venture for Canada that play that role of saying, this is how you actually apply that skill. And I think that that's one of the biggest things that that is potentially missing, but we don't work together. It's either, does this happen inside of, of, the, of the institution or does it happen outside? And can it happen in a, in a system that kind of works together? But again, yeah, we don't have like an, you know, in North America, or we don't have like a, uh, a common language to talk about some of these things. And even the startup and uh, innovation spaces, like incubators and accelerators and uh, tech stars and Y Combinators, the way in which we talk about entrepreneurship, the way we talk about innovation, the way we talk about uh, uh, the skill sets required to thrive in that workforce, like in the, in the, in the MIND sector, vary so much. Even job descriptions and like the, the skill sets required to be a product manager vary so much from job description to job description that it no longer requires like a specific set of skill sets. Right. No, that's a great point. <clears throat> I just, I'm just like thinking about also like, you know, how this relates to like future of like, like future of work, but also future of education and future of universities or university education. Because I think that this is one of the like key components actually for both sides. Um, and when I think about it, like, you know, hearing like, you know, uh, your presentation also like, you know, my interest in the subject, um, I'm mainly interested in like, you know, robotics and the future of work. And I'm involved in like several research projects on that. And I'm also like co-leading a, a training program for graduate students uh, focusing on these issues. And one of the issues that, you know, and I do this as a humanities, you know, as an anthropologist coming from a humanities perspective and I'm working with engineers and business um, school, prof, you know, um, colleagues. And um, so when I like, you know, see myself like, you know, doing this kind of work also like, you know, uh, I also like, you know, think about like, like, you know, liberal arts and the kind of like, you know, the, the role it could play in, uh, in helping us like think about these skills. One thing, I mean, just like, you know, that, that I have noticed is like, you know, we do not actually involve like, you know, like we actually like, you know, like, let's say like, you know, like places like Harvard, Princeton, or, you know, like the places that actually thrive on liberal arts education, we do not actually involve them in these discussions. This is, seems to me like this is mainly like a working class or like kind of like a um, concern. It's that's the, you know, and I mean, I, I don't know, like it's, it's, it's problematic, of course, if that is the case, but I'm also like wondering actually like, so like, are we also like kind of like, you know, creating a kind of like a perspective or we kind of like, you know, uh, endorsing a perspective that actually pushes like liberal arts to, elite and also like skills training whatever you know like however you define it to like to working classes and and it, because so this is like you know of course like there's this like you know weird like you know equity question here in terms of education and that's that was one of the things that you you know raised here and i think that's very important so that is that question but also like if this is the case, so are we actually like missing things that in liberal arts education that we now kind of like push us to like, you know, acknowledge that that's the elites uh, realm? Are there things actually that help, you know, that can help in like, you know, uh, folks, students, uh, you know, in liberal arts education that we are missing now by creating this kind of like separation. Anyway, so this, these are kind of, again, like 
they're not really questions yeah. but like more like kind of like I'm reflecting as you know myself like a you know educator but also someone like studying these things anyway just wanted to like share these questions yeah that's really interesting I think uh I think that that's there's the the cultural you know that's why there's a cultural barrier when we talk about um what you know with the Euro European Union developing this research they're developing it for um an education system a higher education system that's very different it's a highly democratized education system it's an education system where like Erasmus and uh going into you know a a job is a is a priority um and that yes there's like the the um, the culturally elite that just, you know, go to, uh, that aren't necessarily worried about a job coming from going to post-secondary because they know that they're, they're going to going to have one. Right. So it's a, it's a little bit different when you go into, for example, the European, European higher education system, where you're going into law school right away. Right. Uh, whereas, you know, in North America, law school is a second entry bachelor's program. Um, so you have to do your four years of undergrad and then you go to kind of law school right after. Um, whereas where a lot of liberal arts folks from elite universities end up going to, right, is uh, second entry bachelor's programs. So medical school, law school, uh, all the other kind of second entry um, kind of bachelor education. So I think there's like a cultural divide when, yeah, when we talk about we think post-secondary is really important. Like we, as an organization, like we mostly work with students that are in post-secondary. So we're not kind of um, in the conversations that are happening that like, you know, post-secondary education is, is no longer worth it. It's too long to just get a job. We do think that there's like post-secondary education is essential to developing certain, uh, you know, knowledge, uh, yeah, knowledge, knowledge societies, but the realities is that we need people in the labor force. And so how do we kind of work collaboratively to do that, but not create that divide, that cultural divide of the elites versus the non-elites or the working class versus the, the uh, yeah, white collar class. But there's, there's, yeah, there's a lot of cultural questions to think about as we talk about the future of work what are the demographics we're talking about and are we creating further divides or um, kind of segregating folks into the ones that need the skill sets and the ones that don't. Thank you. <clears throat> that was it for kind of my, my kind of our presentation and kind of what we do and um, that's my information if folks want to connect um, for those who are watching and, and um, for those who are here. But does anybody else have any thoughts or questions or uh, want to join us in this conversation for the rest of the 20 minutes that we have? Hello. Hi, Trent. Yeah, I work at a university and there's another area of integration between business and academia and that's the research enterprise that's i'm in a office of community outreach that's going to be renamed research engagement where we bridge our, bridge our research community with a re research community on campus with the broader community to have broader impacts and so um just like that idea between where does liberal education fit in with you know, workforce, where does research fit in with workforce? It's a similar dynamic that's, you know, split and we're trying to integrate it. You know, just kind of a, an observation there. Yeah. Um, does your university have an accelerator incubator also embedded into the business school? Like uh, no, no. Yeah, we're in R2, we're just, um, just got increased research activity status. And we're in a relatively small region, Corpus Christi, the whole metropolitan area, including a county next to us is only about 1 million in population. So we're in that halfway between rural and metropolitan. <laughs> and so trying to figure out what our community can be and that change between, you know, legacy industry, because we're a big oil exporter port 
in re plastics refineries is a major industry, but then we've got tourism and the rise of our educational institution. And so we're at this big nexus on, you know, what do we do to be quote, as our vice president of research says, the intellectual capital of the region in both terms of the word capital, <laughs> you know? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Um, I think uh, one of the things I, yeah, it's like, what do you, what do you need to do to be like a, a thriving and prosperous community? Exactly. Yeah. And one of the interesting things that we've seen specifically with, with increased research and uh, increased funding is, do you create like a virtual community that isn't actually your localized community? And can you have a intellectual community that is like a virtual community but how does that then contribute back to like your local economy? And that's really interesting to think about. I liked the words you used earlier about um, career resiliency. You know, that's what we need in this rapid time, times of change. And the liberal arts education gives people a lot of flexibility and creativity, but it's not really recognized as such, you know? Yeah. If you valued, you know, if employers were to value um, some of the, uh, I have this, um, some of the more of like these kind of like interaction. So this is a bit of a, um, you know, if they were to kind of value things like creativity and vision equally as like uh, some of the other skill sets that I don't mm -hmm. like then could they hire for creativity and then train for the job specific function? Mm -hmm. And I think that that's some of the things that we're looking at is, um, can you hire what is coachable in a job mm -hmm. and what should you kind of value? And if somebody's really creative and um, has, is able to spot opportunities, they're gonna be able to innovate your industry faster. And mm -hmm. what, the, what technical skills do you need to just coach them on? Because if somebody, you know, it's, that's a, that's an easier learn, right? Like we've all learned how fast we all adopted to, uh, to Zoom and to being in a virtual world and to being in a, uh, in a fully remote kind of location. So using, you know, using technology, I think this year we saw how fast people are able to actually adapt when they need to use things, but things like. Uh, self-awareness are really, really tough to coach in a year, whereas technical skills are, you know, something that don't require that much, uh, that much time. And so that's, that's kind of interesting to think about too, is um, what we value as industries and what does your, you know, in-demand industry value mm -hmm. and how do you change that? I saw some interesting numbers talking about data that there's a program being launched for some biotechnology program at the community college in, in the city. And it's a collaborative grant with our university and it's just getting started with the curriculum development. But they noted that in their programs, about 40% are 29 year old or older and almost half already have a bachelor's degree also. And so we're almost flipping the technical training after another type of education and lived experience. That kind of goes with, it, it's kind of different from what we're used to in our education system, but it's a new paradigm I think that's worth looking at. Yeah, definitely. It's almost like a reskilling program. Mm -hmm. More than uh, like a, yeah, traditional education program. It's just reskilling these or skill or yeah, skills add-ons mm -hmm. because you already know how to work. You already know how to do certain things. You're already kind of like a contributing member to, of society. You just need, you know, the jobs are higher paying and therefore that technical skill set will lead to like longer lifetime earnings. So you switch from already having kind of like a first career and first lived experience and then go into more technically trained career sets, career, career paths. And what I think you're doing with your program is giving people a jump start on 
the creative thinking and the risk taking and the innovation that used to come with experience. And now it's going to be exp explicitly taught, which and, and acquired earlier. <laughs> Yeah, we hope so. So that, <laughs> so that you can so that you can acquire the new skills as they develop. Yeah. Yeah. The new technical aspects of your skills. Yeah. Yeah, because it's going to just speed up, right? Your technical skills are going to mm -hmm. be out of date by next year. So if you have like the core softer like human skills and entrepreneurial skills, you can adapt. And I think that's what is really hard is that uh, if you look at entrepreneurialism as adaptability and taking initiative that's kind of really resourcefulness and i think that um in a performance economy you need people who are resourceful and that's yeah. really hard to come by in the in the labor force right and in response to your conversation um a minute ago with e eunice i believe um we just hired a new dean of liberal arts and in the interview they were looking at explaining what the students learn and making it valuable to a variety of types of employers, not even if this, regardless of what the major is, a uh, history major, you know, still has skills that are valuable to employers. They don't have to go in to be a historian at an academic institution. And history and, is so important. <laughs> like we need yes. to learn history. And so what, what they talked about the, the candidate in the interview was teaching the educators about, you know, naming the skills and explicitly looking at them and how they were valuable to the community. So like you said, it was, you have a tr employer training capacity with your program. It's also important to train the educators, you know, in how to define those competencies and skills and add them to their syllabi. Yeah. If they, if they, yeah, if they, if they don't see it as being this, and I think that that's the biggest part is how do we make it not be disruptive to the, mm -hmm. to the, to educators, right? That, that are researchers and, and experts in their domain knowledge to say, people still care about these topics. We also just need them to understand how to transfer them because the reality is very few people can be professors nowadays. So under, for educators to understand that, that what they're teaching is still super valuable, it just needs to translate to other options for, for folks because of the scarcity of, of jobs in a field or in a sector. But yeah, without, I think that that's the biggest part is that that's whole systems change and, and uh, sec cross sectoral approach. That's really interesting. I don't know if professors, but I mean, uh, you as a professor, would you, would you include that in your syllabi? Well, I taught at a junior college in computer science, but soft skills were requests from employers, you know, even more so than some of the technology, because even in, in computer science, the technology was changing faster than we could actually keep up with. We could give basics, but they wanted more of the soft skills and they wanted to retrain on the technical once they got the people. Um, at a university level, you know, the, when you're teaching a subject that you love, you're teaching critical analysis and and creativity and thinking and innovation and looking at it in new ways. And I think that's what the skill in any domain is really what's the most valuable. You know, you enjoy the exploration and the, the intellectual exercise. And if you can make that part of what you value and not just having this reservoir of knowledge, which is actually available to you. It's the ability to process that knowledge is what's enjoyable to teach and see people understand. And you hope that that's whatever they, they take that with them to wherever they go in their career, you know, whether it's, you know, nonprofit community building or industry and, and business. Yeah. Spoken like a true educator. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, maybe like just to add like transfer and I think 
I mean, trying, yeah, just uh, great points, actually. Just one thing I do when I teach, um, you know, humanities courses um, at, you know, um, my institution, Worcester Polytechnic Institute, I try to highlight meta skills, like skills that I think that's, that's, you know, that's perhaps like, you know, something that we do not necessarily like, you know, focus on the, the idea of like, you know, meta skills that actually would help you and guide you to, uh, as you apply, as you apply those specific like skills that, you know, um, you listed, um, or like, you know, the administration might find useful, uh, you know, um, I think that is like, a, and that's, I think, like this idea of, I guess, like, you know, uh, career resilience, I think just like, is, is about that too, not only like having the skills, but also like knowing like, you know, how you actually move between skills, how you combine them, how you apply them depending on different contexts, and also how you perhaps like, you know, um, innovate based on those, you know, skills, because, you know, there might be new frameworks, new, like, you know, new understandings and, you know, uh, because our definition of like these skills are changing, you know, the way we think about like, you know, um, what we call human skills, they have changed as well. So not only like, you know, skills that would be useful for us to like move through history, but also history are changing those skills. So they do not actually like stay as this, you know, as they were, you know, 100 years ago. So in that way, like, you know, if we just focus on the skills as the kind of like those like stable rocks in a way, then we might be missing certain things because, you know, the future might bring up new skills. And we might not be able to like identify them. So in that way, you know, something I called is a meta skill. Uh, and that could actually, you know, could be easily, I think, integrated to like, you know, liberal arts education. And rather than, you know, also like, you do not have to reify. You do not have to like, you know, you don't have to like, say that like, you know, humanities education, liberal arts education is just good for this thing. But if you look at from the perspective of meta skill, you know, training or, you know, that perspective, you do not have to like, you know, functionalize anything because it is much more actually about like the integration and synthesis and, uh, you know, um, contextual knowledge and things of that sort. Mm -hmm. So I think that that is a little bit like beyond the domain knowledge idea, which I think is like central, as you said. Um, but I think that not only like domain knowledge, but also like there are like skills, but I think they're like skills that are like more like meta skill, skills that actually like that help, allows you to comment on skills that allows you to kind of like, you know, uh, revise, reframe and, you know, um, re-articulate skills. Mm -hmm. Anyway, just, just that's like what I try to do. Mm -hmm. What are some of, yeah, I'm curious because I think I, I see competencies as meta skills. Like, I think that's what a competency is, right? So like, um, you know, any of these could be taken in a, in a very bad way, right? Like vision, you know, you could have a, a vision isn't necessarily a, a positive outcome. There can be visions with very negative outcomes. There's political visions that, you know, are extremists that, can, that lead to negative outcomes. But I think being able to talk about vision, storytelling related to vision are all you know, that yes, the, the framing and meaning of the skills might change, um, but the concept of the skills, is that what you mean by meta skills? Um, I mean- Like what's like a meta skill? So I think that meta skills like, you know, could be, you know, anything that allows you to kind of like comment on them, allows you to like see the relations between them. So some of the discussion, especially outcome-based, you know, uh, perspectives on, you know, skills training in higher education, you know, again, isolate certain skills, you know, so that's good because it allows like people to identify the kind of like the, what, how, you know, students can like incorporate some of these skills, you know, right. So that's, that makes sense. But there is this other question, you know, as we kind of like go to the, like, you know, the more detailed, like, you know, unpacking of the skill, but there is this other thing that is actually much more like meta level. And that actually is about like, that allows you to see like, you know, how a skill is used, like you said, like, you know, vision could be used in terrible ways, even, even like the idea of like ethic, ethics or sustainability, you know, we see that big tech companies have like ethics, you know, departments, yeah, but that do not necessarily deliver, right? Yeah. Uh, so 
you know, so the idea of like, you know, what is the promise and what is the, you know, what is delivered on that promise, or, you know, being able to identify these things, they are not actually, they kind of like move beyond the skills idea, I think. So that's one thing. The other is like- Most literacy almost. Yeah, I think I mean, people use literacy, you're right, that people use literacy in this way too, to be able yeah. to like talk about like a set of like skills. Yeah. Uh, because literacy is not only about like, you know, like even just like how we speak languages, right? It's not just about like how you know to, you know, formulate like perfect sen sentences, but being able to apply it, being able to sometimes like comment on mm -hmm. people's, you know, uh, language, being able to report a speech, you know? Um, so yeah, literacy, I think gets into that kind of like organic kind of like, um, I think systems level might be a good way of thinking about it. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, system levels, understanding of the community and social life. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's what I was thinking about the systems and to think back to your negotiation skill example, not only do you want the student to understand what negotiating is, but to look at other skills and be able to break it down. Okay, well, if I'm going to be negotiating, well, I would have to think of something else and let them be able to break it down into the component parts and see how they apply it, you know, and see it as a complex system of their own thinking, you know. And knowing when to apply it, right? Mm -hmm. I think that that's knowing when to actually apply that skill set. I think a uh, that's a big part of, of the, yeah, the, the meta component of it is like, yeah, you have it, you have the skills language, you, you can understand it, you can connect them and how do you action them and when do you action them? And they have to be in time and they have to be in context. And, um, and that, yeah, that requires like a lot of, a, a lot of education around the topic. Yeah, and it takes experience, um, and you can guide people to where they can break things down on their own, you know, autotelic learning, and it, it's not something that people do automatically. They have to learn how to break things down and analyze them and see them as system interactions and complexity. You know, that's part of education is not just getting them, you know, to understand what you're saying, but to understand how they think and to take in new information. So that's kind of the meta concept. Interesting. Yeah, I think, yeah. And also I think that would help us like, you know, to, you know, help students actually like, you know, understand that there are points that you do not negotiate, right? You don't have to negotiate, you know? So again, that's what I mean by like, you know, like we have an understanding that these skills like would be always applied, you know, would be always needed, but there are many situations in business and also social life that we shouldn't use some of these skills, you know, um, uh, because there are like ethical questions that, you know, uh, that might be like, you know, um, perhaps like decisions, especially like your point about social innovation, you know, that, that a lot of like decisions that needs to be made, you know, that need to be made in uh, social innovation projects regarding sustainability, regarding like, you know, social well-being. So in that way, like skills are like, you know, perhaps like great, like, you know, building blocks, but still there are actually a lot of things that goes to, you know, um, decision-making that requires like, you know, people to like step back and think about how they apply it and think about also like what happens if they don't apply those, skills. you know, uh, again, it's very abstract perhaps, uh, it but is. I think that like in life, we are like, you know, presented with these challenges. Yeah, that's really interesting. I, I think that it's, uh, it's, it's hard, it's hard because it's abstract because it's hard to, to measure and to quantify and get data around. Right. Which is also to talk about how important it is to have these conversations. But I really appreciate all of that. I think what you said in terms of like decision-making for me, that's like, taking things into action, right? And it's like, this is making the skill set in, in and of itself. Connecting the dots is, uh, yeah, leveraging resources, all of those kind of higher competencies and how do you actually coach and teach and educate and um, help people understand how they understand it themselves and love, understand how people learn is, um, is a big part of what we kind of, 
forget sometimes in higher education. And we need to start those skills in K through 12, of course. <laughs> yes, and then our education systems are a whole other system, right? That's <laughs> like a K to 12 education is like a whole other system that often doesn't connect with higher education systems. And so that's a whole other conversation, but I know we're at time. Um, thank you so much for the conversation. I really appreciate that. And um, that was kind of where we wanted to to get to and ask some of those kind of tough questions and have those kind of abstract conversations. And I hope that this was useful. And if you want to connect with me, my email is, um, is here. So feel free to reach out. Thank you. Yeah, thank you both.